webinar series presented by the National American Indian and Alaska Native Addiction Technology Transfer Center. I am Kate Trams and I will be administering today's webinar. Today, Harold Tarbell will be presenting Using Multiple Techniques to Facilitate Strategic Planning. This training series is brought to you by the National American Indian and Alaska Native Addiction Technology Transfer Center, or ATTC. The National American Indian and Alaska Native ATTC is one of four national focus centers which serves the ATTC network. The ATTC network is a na nationwide network made up of 10 regional centers, four national focus centers, and a network coordinating office. The map on this slide shows, this, shows the states served by each of the regional ATTCs. To learn more about our center, the network, or your regional center, please visit our website. Our next webinar in this series is scheduled for Wednesday, September 4, where Anthony Stately will be presenting Dancing Along the Fringe, Managing Ethical Dilemmas and Clinical Issues in Substance Abuse Counseling with Tribal Communities. In addition to this webinar series, we offer another series titled The Essential Substance Abuse Skills Webinar Series, which provides an overview of competencies from CSAT's TAP 21 publication addiction counseling competencies. The next session in our Essential Substance Abuse Skills Series will be held on August 21 from 1 to 2.30 Eastern Time, where Kate Speck will present on basic counseling skills. For more information on our webinar series, you can contact Karen Summers at the email address or phone number provided on this slide. Our center is a NADAC certified educational provider and we'd be happy to provide you with CEUs. The cost is $10 to do so. The CEU request form, along with a copy of the PowerPoint, will be sent to you within 24 hours of today's session. If you don't receive the email with handouts within two business days, please contact Karen, Karen Summers using the information provided. In addition to the PowerPoint handout and CEU request form, a consent form and information about participation in our GIPRA evaluation will be attached to the email you receive following today's webinar. We ask that you fill out the consent form and return it by either email or fax. If you agree to complete our evaluation, you will receive a link inviting you to participate in a brief online customer survey. This survey asks about your satisfaction with the event and will take less than 10 minutes to complete. GIPRA stands for the Government Performance and Results Act, and SAMHSA asks us to evaluate our events in order to comply with this act and provide improved performance assessment and accountability. SAMHSA uses information collected by these surveys to determine how many people have attended our events, your satisfaction with our events, how useful our events are to you, we hope you will assist us in gathering information about our services by participating in our evaluation. Before we start today's session, I'd like to give you a quick overview of the GoToWebinar system. To hide or expand your toolbar at any time, you can click the red arrow on, in the top right side of your window. To expand your screen, click the middle button in the top right hand corner. You will be muted for the duration of this webinar. Please use the question chat box to share your questions and comments. Your questions will only be visible to me, the webinar moderator. I will pass your questions along to the presenter at appropriate points in the presentation. For today's presentation, the presenter will be asking a few poll questions at various times throughout the presentation, and you will have an opportunity to respond by choosing from a multiple choice list or by typing a response into the chat box for open-ended questions. We appreciate your participation in these polls as we anticipate that they will enhance the presentation, and we also would like to encourage those who choose to respond to keep answers brief so we can hear from as many participants as possible. We would also like you to be, to, you to be aware that this webinar records participant attention time. If you minimize the webinar or are working in another window, the system will record your participation as inactive, 
which may be reflected in the number of CEUs received. The opinions expressed in this presentation are those of the presenter and do not necessarily reflect the official position of CSAT, SAMHSA, or the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Today's webinar is presented by Harold Tarbell. Harold is a member and formal tribal chairman of the Aquasesne Mohawk Tribe from Northern New York State, Ontario, and Quebec, and is currently living in Vancouver. As you can see, Harold has many years of experience relevant to today's topic, including his work co-facilitating the NAIAN ATTC strategic planning process. Please join me in welcoming Harold Carbell. Thank you, Kate. Uh, hello, everyone. Thanks for joining us today, and I want to thank the ATTC for um, essentially enabling this professional development uh, approach. And given the, in the interest of time, I'll uh, kind of jump right into the uh, presentation. Um, I think we'll do about 40 minutes or so and uh, provide a couple of opportunities throughout uh, for people to um, ask some questions and respond to some questions. Okay, note to self, show the screen. Okay, we'll give it a second to leap back into the presentation. Um, when I leaps back in, uh, any second, I hope. Um, do that. There you go. So in terms of what we're going to do this afternoon uh, or this morning or wherever you are, um, essentially I want to talk a little bit about uh, understanding the process of strategic planning and look at a few models and a number of techniques, uh, a few models for the process overall, and then a number of techniques which can be used um, at various steps uh, throughout the process. And um, you'll see here on this slide that I, I, I mentioned a few of them that I will uh, talk about in terms of uh, they've been proven to be fairly effective or I found them effective in strategic planning uh, that I've done. Um, and I'm going to try to give you a thumbnail sketch of a sort of a facilitator's view of how these techniques work and then how they apply to the overall process itself. I'm also going to talk about a few other concepts that support um, what I would call sort of strategic, more long-range thinking, helping people sort of get the, a bigger picture, um, whether it's just sort of looking at it overall or sort of at the stage where they're starting to develop strategies and goals and uh, objectives. Um, so I'll talk a little bit about change management. I'll talk a little bit about uh, spheres of influence. I'll talk a little bit about creative problem solving processes. And as I mentioned, and as Kate mentioned, so a couple of opportunities, uh, maybe after the first 10 slides and then about uh, two thirds of the way through, we will um, get you a chance to ask some questions and respond and uh, Kate and the ATTC will help us uh, manage that process. So in terms of what is strategic planning, so what this slide is really trying to talk about is to let you know that it's just a tool. So it's not you know a magic pill or a be all and end all, it's just a tool and it's really designed to help um, leaders and I put that in parentheses on purpose because oftentimes we think leaders as supervisors, managers, directors, CEOs, board members, um, but I think that uh, leaders as everybody, so staff, volunteers, clients, community members, they all have some personal leadership qualities that they can exercise uh, through the process and strategic planning is a way of helping uh, that to get done. And so really just being clear about what you what you what you're going to focus on, what you're going to do, and in some respects, what you're not going to do. So here's a nice uh, process definition. So it really does kind of describe the process that you're going to go through in a strategic uh, planning approach. Um, and what I like about it, uh, and, you, and you'll see this uh, definition uh, reflected as we look at some of the models in a moment, but what I, what I like about this is it does add a dimension about building commitment among key stakeholders. and this is something from a facilitating point of view that you uh, don't often see or uh, organizations do, but in the theory of it, it's quite permissible and in many ways recommended that you engage at some point in your strategic planning process with uh, other stakeholders. And um, I'll use the 
term lightly uh, in a Native American context, but so you're talking about uh, funders, you're talking about clients, you're talking about community members, you may be talking about chief and council, you may be talking about uh, other program managers. Um, so there's other ways of doing it, and it doesn't necessarily all have to be in the retreat itself, but there may be ways of engaging them in the strategic planning process to, again, build uh, commitment uh, around clear priorities. So a couple of things on what it doesn't do. Um, you are doing a strategic plan and a strategic planning process and essentially you are making your best estimate, your best judgment about what you're going to do and what you anticipate the current environment uh, means to you and what the future is or the desired state is that you're going to um, create. You know, and that's that's important. That's great. That's the fundamental piece of strategic planning. But you, you know, we we just don't have the ability to predict the future, and so things change, trends change, different things happen, um, people come and go. Uh, uh, you know, who who ten years ago would have predicted the presence of social media and its applications, for example? Uh, lots of great examples out there. So, but you just really have to. Uh, continue to come back to this and be prepared to uh, make the judgments uh, that you need to make. Um, and the line in training, of course, is it's always easier to change a plan you have. Uh, so not a substitute for your judgment. Uh, so really exercising that leadership capacity itself. And uh, so, you know, it's a good process, lots of good techniques, really helps to uh, funnel and focus uh, your thinking on that. But, you know, you still got to come back and uh, make uh, uh, choices and make judgments and really it's um, a lot of times it can be quite an uh, intuitive process um, uh, that you'll you'll be in and rarely smooth and predict your predictable and linear so again there is a nice process and it's all well laid out there's great techniques to use but you are responding to what you're seeing in the environment and what you're engaging with uh, and how you're engaging with your your client or the client group and uh, it really requires the kind of flexibility that you, uh, you'll need. So uh, this, hopefully this will give you that. Uh, the other dynamic where it's not necessarily so linear is in the drafting process. So you really are often looking for some creative restatements of whether it's purpose or um, focus or uh, the scope of work or, you know, you're really looking for um, perhaps some creativity there and uh, maybe some eloquence. And so, uh, again, that's... Uh, it's more of an intuitive process. Some other lessons that have been learned in the process. So make sure that you've got some important issues to focus on. And the note there, if you don't have, you know, fundamental questions or long-range questions to answer, then maybe you don't need a strategic um, plan. Be willing to question about the status quo and the sacred cow. So you know, there's lots of um, uh, we like to call them the elephants in the room that we're not supposed to talk about. And so in some ways, particularly as a facilitator, but within this process, you have to give yourself some permission to engage in that. But you also have to find ways to uh, engage constructively on those kind of things so that, uh, and often facilitators can, uh, can, help, can help with that. Um, again, our whole premise here is uh, have multiple tools at the ready so that you can apply them and modify them as you need to as you go through the process and then produce a document. So I have seen lots of reports on strategic planning retreats, excellent reports on retreats, but not seen the strategic plan, which is the next leap. Um, and so you really got to make sure that it's uh, translated. And the same dynamic I've seen lots of retreat reports, I've seen draft strategic plans, but often I haven't seen final strategic plans, or have I seen sort of what's that connection between that and those operational plans or whatever the organization calls its yearly, quarterly planning cycles. Um, so just making sure that that's there. Um, and in some ways, I think it's important to remember that uh, in strategic planning, you are in fact engaged in a bit of a change management process and uh, well I'll come to a slide on that in a bit. Uh, essentially uh, what that is is it's you are saying this is where we're at, this is where we want to be, um, and you know these are the things we're going to do to get there. Um, and you'll see in that uh, whole slide that it is an issue of uh, transitions and um, those transitions can be often turbulent and my favorite line about uh, change management is that uh, change is very popular when it's being requested. It's not so popular and almost never popular when it's being delivered.
So this next slide, um, here's uh, three samples, three models of strategic planning. First one, nonprofits uh, by Allison and Kay. Second one, preferred futuring by Lippitt, uh, two P's and two T's. And then the third one, simplified uh, strategic planning uh, by Bradford and Duncan. And um, while they each kind of have different steps, I think as you look at that, you'll see that they are basically uh, a fairly similar cycle. Um, and to me, when I look at these, they they essentially are the planning process, right? So, and planning generally is you get ready, you do some pre-planning, you do the formal planning piece, you then figure out how to implement your plan, and then you do some some form of assessment or evaluation or monitoring to make sure that that what you thought was going to work is in fact working the way you thought it was going to work. Uh, another. Uh, framework for thinking of this is often a problem solving process and so uh, in a problem solving process uh, essentially you've got an issue. Uh, you're asked then to do some research on facts and opinions uh, to make sure that you and then restate the issue because um, what often happens is the issue is often not what it presents itself as and then you come then you're required to come up with multiple possible solutions or alternatives which you then assess and then you choose one so you then uh, figure out which one you're actually going to implement. You put that in place. You see what whether that resolves the situation, what, what other issues it may raise, and then you kind of recycle through. And each of these processes is intended to be a bit of a recycling uh, process. Um, of these, the simplified strategic planning is probably the most business oriented when you look at that particular model. And I would note that when you look at the definitions of st strategy and strategic planning, it often talks about sort of the fact that this emerged um, really out of the military work around strategy and then went into some of the larger corporations and then sort of has evolved to sort of the multiple strategies and models that you see uh, now. And this next slide is a fourth, where am I here, there we go. And this next slide, which you know, hopefully it's going to come up, there it is is a fourth model. So the Grove Consultants out of San Francisco, they have a great model. I'm going to actually use their model, a couple of their templates quite a bit. Um, uh, I, I like it in a couple of different ways, um, uh, but I particularly like it because it comes with sort of these graphic templates and they're fantastic for um, artistically challenged facilitators like myself. And so, um, uh, and it kind of adds new whistles and bells often to um, what for many of us, if we've been through lots, of, sat through lots of strategic planning process, are some fairly standard steps that need to be done, um, and so I kind of, I kind of like them uh, quite a bit. Um, uh, it, I just like the way that lays it out, and it kind of does talk about sort of all the things you're reflecting on, and it does talk about this whole idea that essentially you're opening yourself up to some information and some reflection, and then you're making some choices as you sort of move to creating strategies, implementing change, and in fact, what they call living the vision. This, uh, this is reminding me of the uh, Creative Problem Solving Institute's approach and in that one um, they talk a lot about what they call divergent thinking and the Creative Problem Solving Institute is uh, the group that uh, their, their, their claim to fame is that they essentially invented brainstorming and really formalized that whole process over the years. Um, but divergent thinking is really opening yourself up to a wide range of possibilities and then convergent thinking is when you then start to focus in. Um, so in a strategic planning process, generally that's, you know, the first first few stages are really about opening up your, 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 your thinking to what's the available information and what are some of the lessons to be learned and then the, the convergent is really then focusing on priorities and strategies and goals and outcomes. The difference would be that in creative problem solving, they do that convert that divergent convergent thinking step at each phase so at every part of the process so you're constantly um, revisiting reformulating sort of the issues the ideas the actions all of those things that you can come up with uh, so let's take a, a moment there we've just kind of done a fairly uh, quick uh, summary I hope quick summary um, and, and maybe I'll look to Kate to help us here with this particular question uh, around uh, how many of you have facilitated a strategic planning session. Uh, Kate? 
Yeah, so there should be a poll question popping up on your screen at this time. So please take a moment and answer that for us, and we'll have the results here in a few moments. And, and while, we're, while you're doing that, if there are a few other questions that people want to ask, um, now would be a good time to send those into Kate as well, and she'll uh, read those out as, they, as she's tabulating the results on the poll question. And just so you'll know the, 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 the technology, at, while I have the option of sort of going uh, out of my screen uh, to, to look at the um, sort of the, the webinar site itself so I could see the process, I'm, I'm choosing uh, just to stay on my particular screen. So we're going to rely on Kate to uh, feed those questions to me. Yep. So I don't have any other questions coming in right now. It looks like we have... 83% uh, of people have voted so far, so anyone else who wants to take the last um, chance to vote, please do so, or we're going we're gonna to close here in a couple of seconds. All right. Okay, so now um, you can see the results of the poll up on your screen at this time. Um, and yeah, I'll pass it over to you to Harold. I'll pass it back to you to Harold. Harold, so you can um, discuss that. And if anyone else has any questions, please um, type them in the the question chat box, and I'll um, let Harold know about those. Yeah, and uh, just give me the results. I don't. Uh, I didn't. I didn't open my screen. I just didn't want to take the chance. Sure. So it looks like sixty percent of people have said yes. They have facilitated a strategic Excellent. planning process, and forty percent no. Okay, good. So are there any early questions at this point before we move on? None have come in at this point, so. Okay. All right, so then let's kind of move through the process. And just as a quick reminder, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the nonprofit one. So getting ready, developing and reviewing vision and mission, assessing the environment, agreeing on priorities, writing the plan, implementation and monitoring. Um, when you look at the others again, you'll see that they're essentially uh, some of the similar components and simplified has a bit more specific details that they look for in each of the piece and a slightly revised approach, but uh, essentially the same kind of model. All right, so <clears throat> what I'm trying to get at in this slide is that um, there's, there's quite a bit of pre-work that can be done, and um, uh, it just really depends on the organization. And if you're an independent facilitator, it depends on the scope of the contract. Um, most times you'll find that the client tends to want to focus on the retreat itself, and so, you know, which is fine, and there's some real value to that, um, but there are some... Um, some opportunities for things to be done um, uh, beforehand. So, and here's a couple of notes. So, uh, this whole issue of determining the specific choices that should be addressed. So, that what are those five or seven issues in the strategic plan? I do find that that's rarely done. Um, I will have uh, clients come forward, and they will have some issues that they see in their environment that they like to resolve. Um, um, Lots of times, it's uh, the issue is we need a strategic plan uh, for some requirement or you know for some need. Um, but whether they get into this whole issue of uh, these are the specific strategic issues, um, that's another question, and so that's an area where you can really help to start shaping that. Uh, a lot of times, what you get at this point is you get either some let's call them key problems to solve or key organizational priorities or uh, areas of focus that sort of must be uh, somehow in there, and so it's a, which is in, in some ways a little bit different than what are the specific uh, strategic choices that need to be included in there. Um, and again, a lot of it can be done at the retreat, a lot of it can be done beforehand, a lot of it can be done between hand, between the retreat and the actual strategic plan when you're sort of garnering uh, that, uh, that information. Um, one of the things that you can do, and it does talk a little bit about this issue of uh, putting together the organizational profile, um, from an independent point of view, you are trying to do an assessment, trying to get a sense, and trying to really ground yourself in the organization. If you're working internally, it's really about trying to find, uh, in my view, find different ways of stating the organizational profile rather than 
well, let's call it a cut and paste of the website or the brochures or other plans. So really, uh, to me, uh, uh, if we just repeat the organizational profile in the same old standard material, um, what I find is people stop reading it and it certainly uh, detracts from the creativity in some ways. And so I think a little bit of effort needs to go into that. This uh, slide is uh, one of the Grove graphics and it talks about the history. And it is, um, uh, you know, some of the common things that you look at when you're looking at the uh, history itself. So goals and results, projects and strategies, key events, key people, products, services, and sites. Uh, you know, that have happened over the history of the organization and they become a part of the profile. The one thing I might want to add to this might be uh, in a profile piece would be sort of mandate, terms of reference, you know, that kind of uh, um, piece uh, to that. Um, the other, but to me the whole point on this this piece is really that bottom section, the, the learning. So what are, what's the so what of all of that history? What, what did you get out of that or what can you interpret from today's perspective? on that history and so what are some of those uh, lessons that could uh, could 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 help you uh, make some choices about going forward or come up with some strategies uh, by the way the last thing I would say on this is these are quite uh, modifiable uh, and uh, the timeline there that's just happened to be the last one that I uh, used it for on an organization but really you, you change that to reflect the organization that you're you're in Um, by the way, access to these particular slides, uh, I took the Grove training, which is actually where that uh, introductory picture came from. Um, they're pretty open about uh, the use as long as uh, you keep their Grove Consultant International copyright on it. They're pretty flexible about that. So, um, and these are you know getting to be fairly uh, readily available. Although you can buy these templates and these forms. Uh, all shapes and sizes, individual worksheets, uh, flip chart sizes, uh, all the way up to four feet by six feet, so massive sizes, which in and of itself creates a different kind of a dynamic when you're facilitating the strategic planning process. So next step, developing the vision and mission. Um, so mission, vision and mission come in all shapes and sizes. and um, some organizations uh, like to do mission and then vision. Some organizations do only a vision or only a mission. Uh, from the theory of it all, uh, I see it being vision, sort of what's the world you want to create, um, and then mission, the promise we make to each other about how we're going to create that world. Uh, and so there are some definitions. Uh, my, uh, my advice is don't quibble. Over the definition, you're really trying, and, and I think this applies not only here, but at various parts throughout the process, particularly around the difference between a goal and an objective. Um, but really, you're just trying to make sure that the, the logical process of the smallest task or the smallest objective leading to the achievement of the largest piece, which in, you know, my, my model is the vision, um, that there's this sort of logical walkthrough that they all contribute to building up that that ladder. Um, and so really, you're just trying to focus on helping the organization to understand the strategic planning process and sort of that long-range strategic thinking as opposed to, you know, being a, a, a good English teacher. And I, and, I, and I make that point because one of the lessons I've learned is that early in my career, I, and even when I was a staff person for 15 years, um, I would be in a lot of strategic planning sessions that we would argue for two days about the difference between a vision and mission or a goal and an objective or a strategy and a tactic. Um, and as a result, never agree on what they were and never come up with any. So just, you know, from a, a small strategy point of view, just to be careful about that. Um, by the way, I've also seen visions and missions in a wide uh, amount of length. Uh, the largest one I ever saw was uh, three pages, and the shortest ones were essentially taglines, uh, you know, little uh, short little phrases that uh, people were using. And really, to me, it's what, it's what works for the organization. So what really helps them to sort of connect to this ideal of long-range planning, priorities, responsiveness to the environment, and you know, making choices about what is they're going to do for each of those things that leads to the achievement of the vision and the mission. Uh, a couple of techniques, um, generally, 
uh, when we look at this uh, next slide, uh, these are all ways of sort of taking a large group, whether it's 30 people or 40 people, and then finding ways to sort of um, do, well, in the theory is called the large group interactive approach, where you take, you do small work within a large room, and then that sort of builds up into a some kind of consensus. So from a, from a drafting point of view in the room, uh, this whole idea of having people draft their own version and having them work together with a partner and then putting two teams together and then having half the group work together and then the whole work group work together around drafting, that's one of the techniques, pretty common technique described in a lot of the materials. Oh, and by the way, each of these uh, models that I talk about generally comes with some sort of workbook form and has tons of other uh, techniques as well. Um, so that's one way. It's uh, that's you know, uh, drafting by the committee of the whole is a pretty tough way to go. I've um, never had much success with it, but it is a you know it, it, I, it has been successful on occasion. I prefer this other one, which I call the practical vision uh, exercise, and um, in in the United States it's called the technology of participation. Up here in Canada, it's called the it's mostly done by the Institute of Cultural Affairs. Uh, both you know really good, uh, but essentially it's a process of having people work individually and then in groups to come up with a, a, a bit of a table, um, which can be either as a whole the vision, or you can look at the titling cards that are in there, and that's essentially the steps uh, that are there. Um, what I would point out is that often when you do this exercise, people don't like the fact that you make them do 10 and then you ask them only to pick five. Um, but if strategic planning is about choices and regardless of resources you have, you still have to make choices, this is kind of a nice little way of sort of reinforcing that idea um, in the participant's mind. Um, I would say the other um, point I would make here around the uh, the facilitation technique is this idea of when there is an existing uh, vision or mission statement. Um, and, and frankly, from a facilitating point of view, an existing document is often one of the more difficult things to facilitate and make quite interactive. Um, in that way, when there is one, I often uh, find that the individual dyads, quads, halves, whole group drafting is quite helpful. But the strategy, or the approach I take is Rather than trying to nail that down in the room necessarily, um, let's look at this as sort of drafting advice and drafting input, and then either it becomes the work of some volunteers from the room or the formal planning committee, which is mentioned in the uh, getting ready slide, uh, you know, or some other mechanism, or becomes advice to the drafter, whoever holds the pen on that, for putting together the vision and mission statement. Another a couple samples from uh, the Grove. Here's one, the cover vision, cover story vision. So, if your vision and your organization were to be portrayed on, you know, an industry magazine, uh, or a magazine appropriate to your industry, what would it, what would you want it to say? And that's just another good way of pulling out sort of that those motivating, um, motivating ideas. Uh, you know, there, I know there's lots of uh, uh, back and forth around whether visions are effective or not, or you know whether uh, um, but uh, I, I was in preparation for this. I came across across a quote which I thought was pretty pretty impressive, and uh, it was by Einstein, who said, um, "Imagination is more important than knowledge." So I was quite struck by that, and sort of this whole idea that yeah, what we envision, we can then construct. I thought it was quite a powerful example there. Uh, in terms of the Grove. Uh, um, templates. There's quite a few of them. So this one's the cover story. They also have one in the movies. They have one uh, big waves. They have another one which is sort of what they call the mandala, which is essentially these circles within a circle and, you know, I would say it's sort of almost like a uh, an extended medicine wheel kind of concept to visioning. And so they're all good graphics. They're all good drafting input. They make the report look great. They're, they encourage creativity in the room. Uh, so, you know, they, they have kind of an application in both places. Okay. Okay, so next step, assessing the environment. So essentially that is that whole thing of taking stock and uh, really looking at it. And the ideal is not just to, you know, be able to uh, 
you know, put a label on everything that's happening, but it's really about looking at some of those those trends, those positive and negative trends, and then figuring out what they might mean for you. And there's a couple of of, uh, of techniques for doing that. The um, and this idea about what it might mean for you. So it's really trying to find a way to to, to see how much it'll affect your understanding of the issue or the uh, development of the strategies, goals, and objectives. And there are techniques for doing that. Here is the gross context map, which just shows um, the general technique they talk about is what you want to look for those positive and negative trends in the political, economic, demographic, social, technological, and legal environments. So that's a nice place to start. Um, in this model, the, the buildings in the middle, that's you and your organization, your facilities, your programs. Uh, we like to talk a lot about it, particularly in the uh, Native American work about our people and our community members and sort of their needs. So this one gives you an opportunity to that. And then of course the uncertainties, you know, these things we're not sure about, it just gives you a place to park that as you're sort of working your way through the process. It's kind of one of those things about the sort of the lack of a, you know, where it's not so linear sometimes. The other thing about this is that, you know, those are good starting trends, but really when you're looking at this, you often find people talking. Uh, this tends to try to focus outside or externally. Uh, oftentimes people will then look uh, use this as a way of looking internally as well. Uh, the next one is the sort of the um, famous SWOT, internal strengths and weaknesses, external opportunities and threats. And so, you know, generally I think you've all been through the process where, you know, you come up with a good list, you might even rank those lists through a dots exercise or some other, uh, you know, uh, ranking process in the room. Um, and those dots exercises and ranking techniques are really important because uh, it's pretty difficult, uh, given all of the pieces you want to do in a strategic planning process, to arrive at the proper consensus and the proper definition of each of these particular strengths and weaknesses and opportunities and the threats. And so it's just a nice way of uh, getting some early, uh, early input and some, in a way I often call it not necessarily prioritization, but just ranking, just a sense of the room in terms of what are the important issues. Um, dots exercise, quite, quite straightforward. Uh, you get a, if you, depending on the number of choices you have, a number of things on your list, you give the people about a third of those notes and they can vote what I call strategically. They can put all their dots on one thing, they can spread them around. Um, never in my experience have I seen anybody take all their dots and put them on one thing. Uh, generally people uh, have an in, you know, multiple interests about what they want to see done and so you'll see that happen. In terms of this particular um, uh, template you see on the screen, this is about this idea that it's not enough just to have good, ranked, prioritized lists of strengths and weaknesses, opportunities, threats. It's again trying to figure out, is there a tool to help us do the so what does that mean for our organization? And this one really tries to do it. And so I've tried to use sort of a stoplight sort of view. Uh, if you think about it and you look at this chart, so the green area is where the internal strengths and the external opportunities, so both positives, kind of come together. And essentially what this one is saying is that's probably where you want to put a lot of your time and resources. And so it just kind of helps to give you a sense of where you might want to focus and what those might be. Uh, by the way, I just left those examples in there from a, um, a strategic planning group I did with what's called the First Nations Leadership process I did with what's called the First Nations Leadership Council here in British Columbia uh, a few years ago and that was um, that's three province-wide uh, Native American organizations in, in, in British Columbia who for many years were kind of at odds and then about six or seven years ago they sort of came to this agreement that while they had different priorities or different perspectives that there was plenty of room for them to collaborate and so that's what the Leadership Council is attempting to do. Um, sort of the the sort of the yellow area, the caution areas. Uh, when you look to the left, sort of the internal weaknesses and the uh, external um, opportunities. That's a you know still fairly positive. You got to make some choices, but you could invest, you could divest, you could collaborate. An example I like to use there is let's say there's a new funding uh, opportunity, but the organization has just recently had a terrible audit or you know a real uh, loss of staff in its finance department or something like that and so a collaboration would be uh, in order to have access to the funding opportunity you get somebody else with a stellar reputation in finance 
to um, do your financing for you or be your partner on that. So again, another way of looking at that. Um, over to the uh, other yellow one, top right. So internal strengths, external threats. Uh, you know, again. So then you got to look at if it's playing to your strong area and it's a bit of a threat. Well, then you you do want to defend yourself. You probably need to build up there. And of course, the the third, the fourth analysis is uh, sort of the no go zone in some ways where priority weaknesses uh, match, unfortunately, with priority threats. And so what does that mean? So here's damage control, divest, um, you know, get out of the way uh, if you can. Um, but in sometimes this might relate to um, your core interest or your core purpose. And so, uh, you know, much to your surprise, you, you find yourself in this situation. And so then you may need to um, look seriously at what kind of strategies you need to do, what kind of restructuring you might need to, to do at that point. Uh, agreeing on priorities, of course, so this is uh, this covers a lot of ground um, and it's often an area where it's not necessarily so linear and it gets a little bit fluid and uh, in a retreat people get a little uncomfortable, but um, you know, there's nothing wrong with letting a group sit in its own stuff as we like to say in training. Um, in a retreat, it's really about pointing out what the issues are and those come from a number of areas. So they've been issues that have been raised in the discussion in the room. Uh, they may have been identified by the management beforehand or in huddles, uh, you know, during the discussion, or which you as a facilitator may have garnered. And really, it's this whole idea of finding a way to um, uh, state them in fairly um, positive, proactive ways. Um, uh, you know, and almost starting to find ways to word them in sort of that strategic direction, sort of future, long, uh, long-range oriented kind of, of view. Um, and then when you get into the actual strategic plan itself, uh, you get a bit more uh, formal. This next one is the nice uh, definition of a, a strategy. I kind of like it because it's a nice non-sports definition or a metaphor, um, which plays very well sort of for a lot of the West Coast tribes, sort of given the canoeing tradition. Um, so it's not a response to short-term fluctuations in operations or environment. Strategy deals with the predetermined direction toward which these quick responses are pointed. It's concerned with the longer-term course that the ship is steering, not with the waves. And so what often happens is you, you get this whole issue of strategies and tactics and then actions and tasks, and people really tend to want to get uh, into those details a lot of times. From a strategic planning uh, point of view, and when I show you the grow graphic for this one, which has nice whistles and bells to it, you're really looking at sort of the goals and um, uh, objectives piece, um, but you know people have ideas, and that really uh, you know just a good opportunity to get them to get into to let them share those ideas, uh, and then that uh, can feed very well into sort of implementation planning uh, a little bit later down the road. By the way, some key examples where strategies emerge generally, I've been finding it's areas like governance, administration, and management. A small G government. So how do we how do we run our uh, how do we govern our operation, um, administration and management, sort of that day to day stuff. Finance and sustainability are another big area. I'll call them sort of another group is community development or sort of social development uh, areas or focuses. Health, education, jobs, um, youth often a huge area. Uh, there's a number which I would say fall into sort of program improvements as well uh, in terms of some of those critical issues or strategic directions. And uh, often we have patient access or we'll have things like holistic healing approaches, uh, you know, the incorporation of culture and tradition, uh, you know, all of those kinds of pieces. Well, those are generally some of the uh, ones that have uh, appeared. Now, um, I did actually send some notes out prior to this to a few people who work in the field and actually didn't get a lot of responses, so I am going to ask you a question about, um, particularly from the, let's go to the addictions and substance abuse field, uh, what, what things you've seen emerge. Uh, there are a number of um, concepts as well that I, I don't always introduce them, but I didn't generally try to find a way to introduce you know, one or some of them in the process, uh, and just as a way of uh, and what I hope is a way of helping people to see this sort of more strategic, more long-range, more big-picture point of view. And so there's a number of uh, concepts and, and models. So 
just as you look at this, here's a, a nice definition of strategic planning and op versus operational planning, and it's pretty straightforward. And that is one of those things you apply when you're looking at um, the issues that are emerging. Uh, and so as you're trying to figure out what, what are you going to focus the discussion on or the, the, the retreat on or the uh, plan on, and you're, you're really trying to assess what those are from this point of view is, are they strategic? So are they fundamental and long-term? Are they more operational, which are more sort of work plan-ish, more you know, day-to-day, -day, more uh, you know, quarterly, annual kinds of ongoing work that uh, needs to be done? Or are they crisis issues? And crisis issues are often those things which are threaten the survival of the organization, whether it's financing or uh, staff changes or internal conflict or, you know, I'm sure you could come up with a dozen examples of crisis issues. Uh, the important thing to remember is that when you're, by the same token, if you don't have any fundamental choices to be made, then you're not, maybe not, don't necessarily need a strategic plan. If you've got too many crisis issues, um, probably not a good time for strategic planning as well because you're really then focused often on the survival of the organization. And I have seen situations where strategic planning has in fact led to crisis in the sense of, uh, we did one a couple years ago which called on this organization um, to really step up its competency in its particular field and to change a, a, a conflict relationship it had with a major stakeholder and funder in the field and it had that conflict for about 15 years and they you know many recognized the importance of making that shift from a strategic point of view but a couple of their founders couldn't make the shift um, and in one way I think it was a sort of almost like a, a political orientation they couldn't get out of and in another way it was this issue of competency because um, as once you get it, once you have no common enemy then it really comes down to your competency and, and capacity to deliver on the subject matter and so they had this sort of dual-edged sword that they were dealing with and it in effect affected them for about a year and a half um, before they were able to get back into any semblance of strategic planning uh, and in fact the strategic planning retreat at that point was probably more team building than strategic planning although it did uh, help to shape shape the uh, strategic plan or the revisit, revisiting of the strategic plan. Okay, how am I doing on time? Um, so it looks like we may have to move fairly quickly through the next okay. couple um, uh, of sections and I was just going to suggest when we get to that next poll question that we have people submit their answers um, and, and we will gather that information and send that out along with the, the other items in the email we'll be yep. sending rather than going over them now. Okay. Yeah, that was a challenge. I, I have a great, as I was mentioning earlier, I have a lot more sympathy for all the presenters that I've made hurry up uh, as, a, as a moderator over the years. Uh, another example then, and I'll just move through this really quickly, uh, this whole issue of uh, ends versus means, so it's another example of uh, another way of sort of getting them to conceptualize vision versus uh, mission or um, goal versus um, objective or, you know, objective versus activity. So just another way of uh, helping them to look at that. Um, you will note um, ends relate to the purpose, means relate to the, to the so maybe the, the, the what and the why and the means relate to the how. Um, and there's a couple of slides here which um, talk a little bit about um, uh, some examples, and we won't do that at this point, but uh, the answers are on the next slide. Um, and it may be useful when you look at this, uh, if you want to use that sort of technique, uh, to just adapt it to the industry in which you're working. Another good example of, you know, helping people to sort of think through things, and, and I find that these also help in terms of shaping strategies and in terms of shaping goals and objectives and sort of activities, is this whole idea of um, spheres of influence, and it boils down to this issue of everybody in every organization, every part of an organization has direct control of something. They have some direct influence over other, other users, um, or they have uh, basically indirect, and in some of these models they basically talk about virtually no influence or control whatsoever. And so really just trying to use that as a bit of a lens for how you're going to uh, design your uh, strategies. Uh, I mentioned change management, so here's a good slide that shows that. Uh, I would just say that um, uh, even in a corporate environment when you look at that little graph there about what people go through during the transitions, 
uh, even in uh, IBM and uh, General Motors, when they do this, they, they talk about this sort of mini grieving cycle that people go through. And so it gives you a sense of why transitions are so turbulent. Um, and there is some findings that if uh, people can't adjust to change within the first year and a half, then really they should quote unquote move on, whether the organization moves them on or whether they move on. Um, and the example I showed earlier was uh, it literally took a year and a half for that whole process to play itself out. Uh, and there was, you know, some legalities involved and all of that kind of stuff. Uh, so anyway, uh, so change management is a piece. Uh, it helps you to sort of work your way through some of those harder, harder implementation issues. And it's also um, it has some strategies. And so here are some of the common strategies you'll see when you look at the change management stuff um, about how do you create change. So you generate urgency. You get a shared vision. You establish a guiding coalition. You plan for some early wins. You celebrate them and you communicate success. You consolidate change within the organization so it becomes anchored because as many of us know that once you stop pushing for change, we essentially as uh, people in organizations go back to our starting default position and then you adjust plans and generate more change. So just another way of uh, kind of looking at that. There's another resource out there that I've uh, come across by a guy named Gardner called Changing Minds and he's really trying to look at what does it take to change not only your mind but uh, the minds of people whether you're talking sort of in small, you know, family groups or in, you know, small working groups or in large organizations or across the society. So there's some interesting theoretical stuff and some, some strategies there as well, which it might be useful to look at. This last slide here is one of the ones that I've just developed over the years and I use it in a lot of my strategic plans. And it's just a way uh, to restate a lot of the things that I get from the, the retreats and from the research and it's just a nice way of sort of laying it out so you know what's the outcome or result, what's the short, medium, long uh, objectives, what's the products that need to be developed for that process and sometimes in the strategic plan while well, I might use this as a as a worksheet I may in fact uh, uh, summarize just the sort of the strategy, core strategy, the outcomes uh, into sort of a, a direction um, and that's often been fairly um, effective, and a lot, particularly for a lot of organizations who um, are fairly careful about what they uh, um, release publicly, and so it's almost like for the public version of the strategic plan. Uh, here's the grow graphic around that, so pretty standard stuff in terms of work planning. Again, as I mentioned, the strategic planning, you focus on the target there. That's really what you're after. Uh, but generally, you find participants who have ideas on all of these things, particularly around some of the more detailed activities they'd like to see. Um, and so it doesn't hurt to have that uh, fed into the process as well. And so you often see some strategic plans, fairly detailed uh, work plans attached. Uh, here's a nice description of you know goals, objectives, outcome measures, activities, and tasks. Pretty straightforward. Um, uh, what I like here about this one is a couple different definitions. So we're all familiar with the SMART definition of a, of an objective, but there's a couple of a nice one here in terms of this sort of a formula: direction of change plus area of change times target population plus degree or, you know, of uh, change and the time frame. So just another way of um, uh, encouraging people to look at the, the wording that they're using and uh, essentially smart so one of those things where people know it you go yeah 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 whether they actually apply it when they're drafting um, particularly in work groups or small table groups that's another question um, and it's nice to use just when you're doing your own uh, drafting and what one of my friends likes to call splendid isolation uh, the other piece about this one is the whole idea that you can look at process and outcome objectives as well and you know it's just another way of shaping it and sometimes you'll see a lot of the models talk about for each goal let's make sure we have at least two two objectives. Okay so um, Kate there's the uh, next uh, poll questions and I've only got a couple slides after that. Sounds good so uh, at this time um we did want to give a chance for people to answer this question. Um, and I, instead of reading through those at, right now, in the interest of time, I will gather yeah. those comments and we will send that out with the slides when we present yeah. that. In the next well, time. in fact, uh, yeah, but Kay, let, I would say let's see if there are any questions that are out there and let's, let's respond to that. Because the next slides on writing the strategic plan, those are pretty straightforward. And the implementation piece, we don't really have too much on that. Um, the other piece we wanted to get to is if anybody has any implementation successes they can talk to because that's always an area where it's difficult to get people to actually uh, do their implementation and so you know really looking to, to see if uh, people would share that. 
Wonderful. So yeah, go ahead and type your responses and any questions and um, answers into that question chat area at this time. So we may just want to move along at this point um, with the approach to the presentation and then um, if any, feel free to drop in any questions at any time and um, we'll have some more time at the end to go over those then. Okay. All right. So we talked earlier about making sure there is a, a, dra a, a document that's drafted and then sent through the review and formal approval process. Here's a nice outline, you know, which you're, um, you know, quite uh, free to uh, modify, individualize as you need to do. To do. Um, the program and management goals, which are down near the bottom, again, that often gets into some fairly specifics. And you know, uh, I don't often do one where I sort of go through every every division of an organization and develop those. And that's often a pipe piece we leave for the um, implementation planning. And then implementation planning, of course, is just um, you know, what are you going to do? So whatever that is, whether you do operational planning or quarterly planning or business planning or how, however your organization does it, that's really what the implementation planning needs to sort of fit hand in glove with. Um, it's always a challenge where um, we ask people and they commit to doing it, but often don't do the monitoring and evaluation. And so, you know, you get to that situation where the plan sits on the shelf. I did, I did one group where after three years, uh, if they had done what they had said they were going to do, um, they would have been the 17th time they were looking at the plan and essentially when I asked the question, only about a third of the people in the room had ever seen it once and not even all the managers had seen the strategic plan. Now mind you, they had done good work and, and you looked at their work, they had, you know, so whoever had read it or however had fit, they were doing many of the things that were in the strategic plan but they weren't formally coming back and taking a look at it. And so, you know, this whole quarterly review and annual review, it's an important step and, you know, any, any creativity you can bring to that I think makes a big difference because it's not just a, um, a, a consultant's make work recommendation. It is, it is a pretty essential piece to the puzzle. Um, and sometimes it's one of those areas where you often then do that sort of not so linear, you need to struggle a little bit about what are those connections. The way I like to describe a strategic plan is it should help you make choices whether you're wherever you are in the organization when you come to a situation where you've got a complex situation or you've got a choice to make, you should be able to look at the strategic plan and it should help you in some ways to decide what to do and to define what it is you're going to do. And uh, finally, my hope is that uh, this has provided you guys with a uh, um, uh, useful perspective and encourage you to learn more about these and other techniques. And I want to encourage all of you who are going to be facilitating or drafting uh, strategic plans and wish you some luck. Um, I will encourage as well what I call a facilitation guide, particularly when you're going to be doing a retreat. Um, and that's basically your plan for the process or the retreat. Um, it's uh, described in a lot of facilitation books and those books come with a host of other techniques and tools which you can apply and use during the strategic planning process. So it's a nice crosswalk between the strategic planning models and the facilitation te techniques. Um, and I hope uh, this helps you to keep a focus on the purpose when things change. So when you look at that facilitation guide in the retreat and things get complex and things get busy and you know you get tired and they get tired, uh, really that uh, having that facilitation guide which is your plan allows you to sort of always kind of come back to your overall purpose. So. Uh, that's, uh, anyway, as another as final facilitation technique, uh, that's what I will suggest. And there is my contact information. So thank you very much. Great. That's okay. um, that uh, wonderful. And I just wanted to say again, if um, if people wanted to send in their experiences, their successes, their techniques, um, feel free to type those into that question chat area. Um, and also we'll take questions for um, Harold at this time. If you have any questions for him, um, type those in there. Um, so we'll take a few minutes for that.
Okay, and it looks like there, um, I don't have any questions at the moment, so we are going to move forward. And I just wanted to um, thank Harold again for sharing his knowledge with us today um, and his experience with strategic planning. Uh, please watch for our email with handouts for this webinar. Attachments will include a CEU request form, PowerPoint handout, and a Gipper consent form. We appreciate your decision to participate in our Gipper evaluation, as completion of these forms allows us to so show SAMHSA the number of people served by our webinar. To participate in the Gipper evaluation, return the signed consent form to our center by email or fax. We hope you'll be able to join us for the next webinar in this series. On September 4, Anthony Stately will be presenting Dancing Along the Fringe, Managing Ethical Dilemmas and Clinical Issues in Substance Abuse Counseling with Tribal Communities. We also hope you'll be able to join us for our next webinar in our Essential Substance Abuse Skills webinar series on August 21, where Kate Speck will be presenting on Basic Counseling Skills. Thank you for your time participating in the session today. We hope you enjoyed the session and look forward to hearing your feedback.